As you know, uh, some of you in your small groups are already doing it. It's uh, called Soul Care, the series. Uh, some of you are reading the book, some of you are watching the video, and some of you are doing both, like myself. Um, and our author, uh, Dr. Bob Reimer, uh, he gave a really, he gave an example in the intro video, and I don't know if you've uh, watched the intro video, but he likened our soul to be like a suitcase. And uh, a suitcase uh, of our soul may be full of clothes, right? Like packed, like uh, clothes that are labeled with uh, such like anxiety, lies about our identity, sin, family history, etc. And the reason why he's labeling these things and saying that uh, our soul is full of these is because it's so full that there may be no room for God to work and transform us. So hence, like, many of us are, grow, are, are raised in Christian homes. And a lot of us have, you know, done our Bible studies, watched videos, went to conferences. We even go to worship conferences. But then how come, ever wonder, how come, some of us ask ourselves, how come that we're no different from point A to point B? That we're the same person as when we went in, when we come out. How come there's no transformation? Sure, there's this little spike, but then we still need it. It seems like uh, the next year around, or even in the next nine months, we feel that we still need that jolt. How come it's not permanent? How come there's no you know, progress of transformation that we all desire? If we all call ourselves as Christ followers and we want to be genuine Christians, we believe that the Holy Spirit should work in us to transform us to become more like Jesus. The question is, how come? And so Dr. Rob Reimer offers saying, because our souls are full of, full of clothes. So full that it's like full of anxieties, fears, lies, maybe sins, maybe secret sins, maybe um, our lies about our identity, family history. It's just packed that we are not allowing, or we don't even know that we're not allowing, that the Holy Spirit actually cannot work in us. And so, hence, uh, after our very first prayer meeting of church history, in church history, the, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, a lot of us uh, actually brought forward in our prayer request and then brought forward when we were sharing that we're lacking that joy and passion, that we can have lots of sense of God's presence during worship, in our studies, in our small groups, and then we're wondering why. So we prayed. And you know what? I prayed. And we all prayed. And then uh, a friend of mine uh, who uh, pastors at Fraser Lands Church, he offered the book Soul Care. And therefore, I felt this is a good series for us to do together. All of us may need to, probably need, to unpack that suitcase and figure out how are we going to allow God to break into our hearts and our souls to transform us. Because I'm sure we all desire, deep down we all desire, to take it to the next level. To become deeper with God. So, we went through various, we went last week, uh, actually the two weeks before, we introduced the principles that they brought, the book brought up. The various barriers that block us from allowing God to work in us. First, it was identity, uh, the lies about our identity. Second, is about repentance. Uh, third, breaking family sin patterns. Forgiving others is next. Healing hurts. And then lastly, overcoming fears. Oh, sorry, overcoming fears. And then lastly, breaking dynamic, dem dynamic, demonic strongholds. And last Sunday, for those who just joined us today, we did the first one. We address the lies about our identity. And so, what is the lie? Well, well, okay, first of all, why did Dr. Rob Reimer put out identity? Why is it about, what is it about identity that's blocking us from receiving God's transformative power or, his, or allowing us to experience his presence? Well, here's the thesis that we were unpacking last Sunday. If you only understood who you are in Christ, if you only believe what God believes about you, it would revolutionize the way you live. Let's say it again. If you only understood who you are in Christ, if you only believed what God believes about you, it would revolutionize the way you live. So we first looked at symptoms, right? That manifest from lies that we have allowed to take root in our souls. Because whatever we agree, we agree with, we give power to. Some of the symptoms, what were they? Defensiveness. Right? Like so if somebody criticizes us, or if somebody does not, uh, does not agree with us, or somebody's not doing what we want, we become defensive. 
Why? Because probably there's a deep lie rooted in our identity. Second, pettiness. Why are we so petty? I, I, remember, I shared with you guys, right? My pettiness is uh, having to witness people that are late when they promise to be on time, right? And then I get really irritated when people are late. Don't worry, I'm not irritating you. Well, I'm slowly still working on it, okay? But, you know, those type of things. Why are we so petty? Why are we so petty in picking, nitpicking things about other people's wrongs? Or when we get wrong, we become petty. Because there's a, there's a deep lie about our identity. We're allowing something to lie about our identity and we believe it. And then lastly, uh, this is not the last uh, symptom, but it's a symptom that we went over. We looked at compulsive behavior. Things like addiction, uh, things like workaholism, etc. Why are we compulsively wanting to perform? Why do we want to continue to uh, achieve that compulsive behavior? Or the compulsive behavior of trying to want more, to desire more money, to desire more resources, to, or the compulsive behavior of feeling that there's not enough, right? What are those lies then that these symptoms are pointing to? And so we went over a few of those lies, right? And, the most, and some of the common ones were like performance lie, that my value, the value of myself is based on performance and achievements and the end result. The second line is about pleasing people, that the, number, the more people that like me, I, 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 that, that makes me more valuable. And unfortunately, uh, we become susceptible to it many times, especially with you know, the likes of Facebook, etc. Like, how many followers do you have, type of thing, right? It's like uh, we attach that type of value to ourselves and we lie to ourselves that, hey, if I can make as many people to like me, I'm valuable. And then the lastly, the last line is control. How much do we, how, like, the end result? Is the end result what I want? And if the end result is what I get, is then I am valuable. That's my, attach my value to it. I gave an example, community day that's coming up, right? I'm very tempted to put my value on that. Think about it. The whole thing is riding on it. I put so much work on it now. Well, you, I, you guys too. We all put so much work on this. Volunteering, planning, rallying nine organizations to come, getting TD to sponsor this, getting a, like, and then getting TNT to sponsor it. All this is riding on it. What happens if it rains? Is my value going to go boom, plummet, because of the failure of community day? Just because I define the end result? That's a lie, because I do not have control, but, if, but maybe we attach our identity on the ability to control. So we concluded with this last week. So what is our true identity? The issue of our, so I quoted, the issue of your value and identity is settled at the cross. On the cross, the Father said to you and me, you are infinite worth to me. I declare to you to be worthy of my son's blood. If Jesus died for us, then what can diminish our worth? Not rejection, not enemies, not hatred, not criticism, not abandonment, not abuse, not a spouse who leaves you or no longer loves you, not bad performances, not failures, not circumstances out of your control or people beyond your reach. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Amen. I, 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 I did an angel in Kiefer's wedding, and some of you were there. And this is the passage that I actually spoke on. Because there will be days when uh, we feel that our spouse does not love us, but does that mean that you're not valuable? Do we attach that to that value? We have to remind ourselves that, you know, no, God loves us. That's the value. My value is on the cross. Okay, so let's move on. This morning, here's, the, here's what I really want to unpack this morning. Now remember, these principles that we are embarking on each week is to unpack the suitcase so that we can give space for God to transform us and for us to experience his presence in a more intimate way. First was to address the lies about our identity. And now, it's our sin. This is a tough one, so let's go. And here's the thesis that we want to unpack. There's no freedom without forgiveness. There's no forgiveness without repentance. So let's jump right into it with a video. The fireplace. 
Don't lie to me. Honestly, we went over to Mikey's dad's place, and we found a map that said that underneath this place there's buried treasure. Well, don't give us none of your bullshit stories, huh? <laughs> hey, kid, I want you to spill your guts. Tell us everything. 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 Okay, I'll talk. <laughs> In third grade, I cheated on my history exam. In fourth grade, I stole my uncle back to toupee and I glued it on my face when I played Moses in my Hebrew school play. In fifth grade, I knocked my sister Edie down the stairs and I blamed it on the semi to a, to a summer camp for fat kids. And then was during lunch, I got nuts and I pinged out and they kicked me out. But the worst thing I ever done, I mixed up all this fake puke at home, and then I went to this movie theater, hid the puke in my jacket, climbed up to the balcony, and then, then I made a noise like this. And then I dumped it over the side. Oh, and all the people in the audience, then, 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 then this was horrible. All the people started getting sick and throwing up all over each other. I never felt so bad in my entire life. Well, I'm beginning to like these <laughs> days. <laughs> anyway, so what did Chunk do in this video? Well, in a Christian sense, we would call it repentance, right? He literally rehashed all his wrongdoings in front of these gangsters, right? And like, uh, in grade three, I cheated on my history exam. In grade four, I did this. Grade five, I pushed my sister down the stairs. I blamed it on the dog. Great, blah, 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 right? So he was like literally spilling all his like sins, right? That he hid from everyone, right? And now he just told everything. What's a biblical definition of repentance, though? Is it about spilling our guts out? Well, here's a, a quote from the book. Biblical repentance is about changing your mind and purpose. It is about changing the way you think. It is about bringing yourself into alignment with God. When your heart, your behavior, your belief system, or your thinking deviates from God's ways and doings, your soul gets out of alignment. Repentance, therefore, is a soul alignment. Why at times do we have anxieties, burdens, frustrations, either with ourselves or with others? Why do some, that we sometimes feel enslaved by the voices in our heads? telling us things that we know are wrong. Why do we think about things having feelings that we know are wrong, like lust, envy, or jealousy? Why can't we get rid of them? And in, even if we think we get rid of them, why do they keep popping up? How can we keep confessing to the same sin? How come we can't get rid of it? It is because our soul is not aligned with God. There are deep-rooted sins that we have not truly repented. Here's the promise from God. True repentance will make your soul breathe a sigh of relief. True repentance will refresh your soul. But without true repentance, without getting our soul in right alignment with God, your soul is subject to disease. And you know what, folks? Our soul is highly connected with our physical self as well, because that is our being. And you probably know with some individuals as well, that if things are really deep down hidden secretly inside, it does transpire into our physical self. People do notice. So here's another quote that I found helpful. If your soul is going to get healthy, you have to be in right alignment with God. And when you are out of alignment, you must repent. You must admit when your thinking and your behaviors are different than God's ways and doings, and then you must turn from your wayward path and turn back to God. You won't get well until you are more concerned with being good than you are with looking good. And here's a clincher that really stuck out for, for me when Dr. Reimer quoted uh, from John Bradshaw, quote, you are only as sick as the secrets that you keep. See, uh, John Bradshaw is um, he's more of an orthodox Christian, and uh, he believes that there's a highly connection between our physical self with our spiritual self. And so you are only as sick as the secrets that you keep. If you're going to walk free, you must not walk in secrecy. It is a powerful thing to be open and honest. There is no healing when there is, is pretending. Here's another video, and it's a clip from the video series that you guys are going through. So I just took this clip out uh, from that video Years series. Years ago. So give it a watch. I was in a space in my life where I was struggling with a pattern of behavior. I was in my 20s, and I was struggling with lust. And I went into my office 
And I go into this place where I have thousands of books and I'm standing in there and I said, Lord, I am stuck and I don't know how to get out. I keep confessing this sin, but I'm not able to break free from this sin and I don't know what to do. And um, I sat there in my office and I said, Lord, if there's a book on a shelf that can help me, I, I, would, I would like you to show. And I heard the Lord speak to me and he said to me, you have, I had an eight foot bookshelf in my office. And he said to me, there's a book up there on top of that shelf, reach up and grab that book. And literally I put my hand up there and patted around and sure enough, there was a little book up there. I'd thrown it up there because it had an ugly cover and I thought I'm never going to read this book. And I chucked it up there. Somebody had given it to me, you know, and I threw it up there. And so I picked this book up and I thought, okay, I'm going to read this book. Well, it was Norm Grubb's book, Continuous Revival. It is a fabulous read, short, you know, like 60 pages, terrific, worth its weight in gold. And I read this book, and he's talking about First John chapter 1, about walking in the light with God and others. And I'm sitting there reading this book, and the whole time I'm sitting in bed, my wife's sitting next to me, and as I'm sitting there in bed and she's sitting next to me, I am under deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. Like, I need to confess to her that I'm struggling with lust. And I hear the Holy Spirit say this to me, you need to tell her. And I'm like, I ain't telling her. So you don't understand, you're not married. You don't get this. If I tell her, she's going to get mad at me. She I don't want her mad at me. I said, you don't understand. She's going to cry. I'm going to feel bad. I said, I, I, I could tell my friends. I mean, my guy friends, they'll get it. They'll go, oh, I know. I feel so bad for you. I get it. You, you know, you're struggling with life. But she won't get it. She's not going to understand. I'm not telling her. So I did what any man of God would do under those circumstances. I shut off my light and rolled over and went to bed. The only problem was I couldn't sleep. So I'm laying there in bed. I'm, I'm tossing and turning. And finally, I thought, all right, I give up. So I look at her and I said to her, sweetie, are you awake? She goes, who could sleep with you tossing and turning? I said to her, I need to talk to you. She goes, it's about time. So I said to her, you know, I'm struggling with lust and I've been trying to break this pattern. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm just, I need to confess. She cried. I looked at, I said, see, I told you. I knew you were going to cry. I knew that was what happened, Lord. But here's the key. It actually broke the pattern and the power of lust in my life. See, what John understood is when you bring things into the light, light always dispels darkness. And John knew it. Your secrets hold power over your life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. And then I also put it up on the screen. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. See, when I read, uh, Dr. Reimer uh, put this passage in, the highlight for me when he actually expounded this passage was actually John's logic in this passage. So follow, follow me if you can. Let's follow this. God is light. Good. So far, so good, right? We know that. God is light. In him, there's no darkness. Pretty standard. So far, so good. So if we claim to be Christian yet walk in the darkness, as in unrepentant or lying to ourselves that we do not have sin, then we are not living in the truth. And on the side note, we know that when Jesus said the truth will set you free, well, if we're not living the truth, then we're not free. Got it? So, so far, so good. So God is light. If we're lying to ourselves that we have no sin, we're in darkness. And we're not living in the truth. And the truth is the, the very truth that gives us freedom. So now here's the logic that stuck out for me. John says this. If we walk in the light, i.e. aligned with God, holding the truth and have no secrets to hide, nothing to hide, no hiding of any sins, we have fellowship with one another. Not just God, but with one another. Interesting, right? Remember what Jesus said when the Pharisee asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, what, love God with all your all, but also love your neighbor as well, in the same way? He put them together. And why is that? It's because our relationship with God is also correlated with our relationship with others, especially with those who we love, like our spouses, for those who are married. We cannot have a good relationship with our spouse, with our friends, with our colleagues, if we have a lousy relationship with God, then vice versa. Those things come to, are together. And so if we have stuff that we are hidden, our secrets, our secrets inside of our lives, things that we are hid, we're hiding from others, we're putting up a facade, like a, a straw man for people to see, that is going to jeopardize our relationship with others. But not just that, at the same time, 
we jeopardize our relationship with God, and vice versa. If we put up a facade for God, we're jeopardizing our relationship with other people as well. John's logic is basically saying that if we live in the light, if we are true to ourselves and true with God, if we allow the, the God's light to shine into our brokenness, into our sins, into those hidden places, then the darkness is dispelled. We have freedom. There was a song by Carolyn Ahrens, some of you may know her. She said she uh, wrote a song about broken jars. And the reason why she did that was because only when our jars are broken, that's why Doug Paul says jars of clay, because they're easily broken. It's that it's only when the jars are broken that the light can shine through. Are there are areas in our lives that we need to break so that we can allow God's light to shine through. Here's a quote. Only the proud seek to cover up and pretend to be more than they are. Norman Grubb, in his book, Continuous Revival, wrote, Openness before man is the genuine proof of sincerity before God. Even as righteousness before man and love to man are the genuine proofs of righteousness before God and love to God. Note, also that hiding the truth about ourselves before men, pretending to be better than we really are, is a supreme sin which Jesus dropped home to the Pharisees. A soul in alignment is a soul without secrets. We cannot walk free if we will not repent from sin and bring it into the light with God and others. So this morning, many of us probably have secrets that we've been laboriously hiding from people. We put up a facade every time we meet with our closest friends and our small group members by telling them that we're fine. You see, don't get me wrong, folks. I've been born and raised in a Christian home. I went through many countless small groups. And every time it comes to a prayer request, what well, usually uh, is a prayer request? What are the, some of the prayer requests that are common? Work, time management, stress, relationships with people, right? And then, uh, and then yet, <laughs> I always find that those are really just items that are palatable for the small group. You want to be palatable? It means that it doesn't reveal any messiness. Praying for work, great. Praying for like a stress matter, great. Because you know why? It just kind of ends that discussion right there. And say, okay, let's just pray for that and that's it. And done. Oh, hey, great. We still have time for a small group to like, like snacks and stuff, right? The problem is, is that once we get into nitty gritty and the dirty stuff, the messiness, the secrets, it opens up something. It's called vulnerability. And also it opens up work. Seriously, it takes a lot of time. When somebody opens up, I still remember in my old men's group, we, uh, we, uh, my mentor gave us seven questions to ask ourselves in a Muslim men's group. And one of the questions was, have you ever uh, made yourself susceptible to another woman? Right? Have you, has it, like, that could damage your relationship with your wife? And then when uh, one of my guys that shared it, we went, all of us looked at each other and went, oh, this is going to take a while. Right? <laughs> it's like, because it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. Because the, 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 your very brother has now made himself vulnerable. There will be tears. There'll be lots of prayer, a lot of repentance, because not only will that, did the brother share, everyone else started to break down and share about their issues. It takes time. It's going to, make a, it's going to take lots of time, a lot of prayer, lots of vulnerability, and it's going to be opening up to danger zones that we have to get at. In your, so my question about us, like just reflect upon your own small groups. Do you have that moment where you go beyond just work? that you go, wait, let's just like quit this facade. Let's go even deeper than that. Are there sins that we're hiding that we need to reveal here and now in our small group or the people that we trust, to the people that we trust? And if those who are married, are there sins that are hidden in our, in, within us that we need to reveal to our spouses, like then and now, right now? Because only then God promises, so saying that there's no freedom without forgiveness, and there's no forgiveness without repentance. And part of the repentance process is just to reveal our sins to each other. Okay, so what is this process of repentance then? Well, first of all, there's a, we have to be receptive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A healthy soul has a contrite heart. What does that mean? It is having a heart that is receptive to the conviction that the Holy Spirit has embedded in us with regards to the sins we have committed or held in secret. A heart that is malleable for God to form and work on. Keeping sins, so keeping sins hidden and leaving it to fester actually hardens our hearts and become less and less receptive of God's pricking. 
You guys follow that? It goes like this, like, if we leave sins that are hidden and let it to fester, ever wonder why every time we go into worship service or every time I speak at the pulpit or every time yeah, you read your Bibles, it never seems to affect you anymore? It doesn't convict? It doesn't put any transformative power into our lives anymore? It's because we're leaving some sins festering inside of us, hardening our hearts so that it blocks that cogent power of the Holy Spirit. That no matter how many times we sing, I've seen some of you uh, posted on your Facebooks that you went to Hillsong. No matter how many times you go to Hillsong, how, why are, you, are we still the same person from point A before we go in to point B when we come out? Are there sins that we are hiding that we have to reveal to allow the God's light to reveal to it, shine his light into that darkness so that we can be free from that bondage so that we can finally unleash the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us inside of us. Because if we don't experience transformation or God's presence or his pricking, if you are the same person, A, going in and as person me coming out, you gotta ask yourself. You gotta do some self-reflection. Take some time of solitude, like in chapter one, part one of our series, of, like when Dr. Ryan about, like, uh, provided us with various ways to go into solitude and be experiencing God's presence. Seriously, folks, like, I, like, I talked with a lot of uh, pastors. They get the disappointed because, uh, you know, whenever they speak and they know that somebody's sitting in front of them, <laughs> you know, that they even know who it is, right? And they go, how come that person's still not changing, right? Like, we, we were praying and preaching and we're praying with them and they're going through these conferences and everything, but they're not changing. It's because they're not, they themselves have to choose to reveal that darkness to God. They, we cannot do it. I cannot do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Second, owning our sins. Before we begin to even uh, ask for repentance, we have to admit it. Um, I give you an example. Oh, just before that, re just remember this. I know that I just like a, laid almost like a ha proverbial hammer on, the, on this. But remember that the beautiful message of the gospel is that though you are deeply flawed, though we are deeply flawed, you are even more deeply loved. God invites you to come into the light. So remember this, no matter how horrible you feel you are at this moment, you feel that, man, I have this secret sin, but I don't even know if God will forgive it. No. Remind yourself of, with a song that we just sung. Amazing grace, how sweet and how abundant, right? Okay, second, owning our sin. Now, so, um, I'll give you a recent example. Rosanna, my wife here, uh, she realized that like, uh, I sometimes get a little heavy-handed on my anger, <laughs> and I do. And uh, I'm gonna talk about a why, because I've noticed that in my family generation, we have an anger streak. We could be, I could call all my dads and my granddads and they're the sons of thunder. Okay, so like, including my mom's side, so daughters of thunder. So when daughter of thunder and son of thunder married, it's not a good thing. So, but um, I realized that I have a temperament, a hot temperament. And when I when I kind of got angry, kind of got no, I did <laughs> got angry with Annabelle. Annabelle, okay, she's pretty good. She doesn't really cry, but she you could notice that she's tearing you up. She knows that you're getting angry at her. She hates that. And then uh, Rosanna goes and she goes, you know, you have an anger issue, <laughs> right? You, you, like, you gotta control it. There's ways of, for me to respond, wasn't there? There's choices. I could say, no, you made me angry, <laughs> right? It's not my fault, you made me angry. Like, how dare you, right? Annabelle was wrong, she made me angry. I don't have an anger issue, I just have righteous anger. My <laughs> anger is justified, right? Or I could own it. I could say, no, I, I'm wrong. Yes, I do have anger issues and I need to go into solitude with God to repent. And please call me on it every time I do. And they do call me on it every time I do. But it's the, the fact that I have to own those sins. I cannot blame it on my dad. I cannot blame it on my granddad. I cannot blame it on my mom. That, oh, I was brought up that way. Oh, I only saw one example, right, in my life. No. I have to own that sin. I have to own it. So in order to own our sin, we need to reveal it with someone who we trust. And for those who are married, you, you, really, you reveal it to your spouses. If we are not, we need to reveal it with our small group members who we trust. 
And also, most importantly, those members that those members need to also fill us up. Because if we empty, we need to be filled again. Right? For those of you who are watching the videos, you recall that in the in the very first part, is that when you empty, when you keep on emptying, you need to find people that will continue to fill you up. Right? You can't just continue to empty. So we have to find people that we whom we trust, godly people that could actually fill us up when we do. See, there's freedom when we confess our sins. There's freedom when I confess that I am wrong when, when I, I speak to Rosanna because now we continue to know that we're building this relationship, that we're authentic with each other, that we're honest, that we're free to be ourselves, that we can be free to allow God to work in our marriage to become better. You, you follow? And you know, for us to reveal our wrongs to our coworkers, our colleagues, our friends in our small group, we are free now to be more of ourselves and we're free to, we're free to trust in God. So for you not, we need... So there's freedom when we confess our sins. Here's a quote, here's a quote. Secrecy and darkness produce a false sense of security in the midst of a heart full of fear, but they can never result in freedom. Only the light of God can purge, cleanse, heal, restore, and set you free. If you want transformation, you must embrace the light of God, end quote. If you find yourself saying this, I've never told this to anyone, it's time to tell someone. It's time to tell someone. Only then will we find freedom. Next, cultivating godly sorrow. So what is godly sorrow? Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. What's an example of worldly sorrow? I'm sorry that I got caught. I am sorry about the consequences. I am sorry you think poorly of me. But godly sorrow says, I'm sorry for my sin. I am sorry for the way I have hurt you and offended God. Godly sorrow flows from the pierced heart. And in order for our hearts to be pierced, we need to soften our hearts. And to soften it is to quit hiding our secrets. Dr. Reimer offered a few steps on how to soften our hearts. And one of those steps stuck out for me. Because in my opinion, we live in an age of passivity. And we tend to blame others for our tribulations to take responsibility for our part. Uh, I, have a few, I have quite a few friends that, that uh, Rosanna and I share as friends. And uh, you know, when relationships break down, what is usually the most common thing that, that comes up? It's their fault. It's their fault, not mine. Well, unfortunately, we really need to take responsibility for our own actions. And I, I remember when I preached on one, one sermon way back, there's a, there's a term called responsibility. It's our own. Uh, we have to be able to respond well. And we have to own our part of our responsibility. So even though, let's say, uh, somebody that, who we love or our spouse did something wrong and, uh, and then they committed something against us, we can't just say, oh, it's all their responsibility. It's 100% their fault. No. In all relationships, it's either, there, there's got to be something that we have to take ownership of. Maybe it's just 10%. But like the author said here, we also have to take 100% responsibility of the 10%. We can't just deny that. You follow? So we have to own it, but also to cultivate godly sorrow that brings repentance, which means to own, take ownership of it and to leave it not hiding in there. We have to not look at other people and blame other people for it. We gotta take responsibility for it. Last, fourth, it's about shame. Do some of us wonder why we don't feel forgiven from a sin that we committed a long time ago? Ever had those? You know, we keep repenting and repenting and repenting, but it's never forgiven. That we find ourselves like uh, often uh, just keep on asking God, please uh, forgive us, uh, forgive me for that sin that I did quite a while back. Well, do you know why? It's because time does not cleanse sin. Only Jesus' blood cleanses your sin. Only Jesus' blood cleanses our sin. See, Jesus doesn't want you to know cognitively that you are forgiven. Most of us know that. Most of us, when we pray and, or even just do studies, we are cognitively know that we are forgiven. But he wants us to experience true release. I am convinced that Jesus not only wants to help us to be forgiven and to have a right standing with God, he also wants us to experience the liberation of our forgiveness, our freedom in our spirit. Freedom, forgiven, and, and that our sins are purged. He wants us to experience that. But then, often we're clouded with guilt, shame, and condemnation. 
So how do we get past that then? How do we get out of this vicious cycle of asking for forgiveness from a past sin? Well, first is to actually reveal it, to expose it, to actually admit it and take ownership of it, to follow these steps, to actually to bring it to a friend, to bring it to a trusted friend, to bring it to your spouse, to bring it to somebody that, whom you know that you need to repent to. Then follow up with uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to actually mold our spirit, mold our souls, mold our hearts, to, to actually have godly sorrow, to actually say, no, this is my sin. I take full responsibility of it. I am not going to blame others for it. This is who I am, and I'm going to take responsibility of it. But also, lastly, and this is a, the last part of the, the steps, is to actually practice the presence of God. That how many of us, after the first uh, part one of our series, have actually found the time to go into solitude, to actually practice to take the time? Do any of us have a Sabbath? Have we actually dedicated uh, one day of the week or one part of our day as a Sabbath day, two hours, maybe three hours? Or are we really, really bombarded with busyness? Right? Have we ever, have we, since the part one, have we t put it into practice and say, Look, I am going to maybe open an app, use the uh, Bible app, or the uh, our, like. I'm using the Our Daily Bread app, you know, and just go into my sol uh, solitary space, just by myself with God, and so that I could sense His presence, desire, and stay silent, just to allow Him to speak through either nature or through just the winds, and just allow the stillness and the quietness just to permeate, so that whatever I read. It soaks into my heart and just opens up whatever that God wants me to reveal to him or convict me. How many of us have that now? And if you don't, I encourage you to do. To, to actually take that space, take that time, to just uh, find that Sabbath so that we can get into the presence of the Spirit. Because, like I said, I could preach as much as that, about this as I can up here at the pulpit. You can sing as many songs as you can, uh, up here in our at your time and you know worship songs you can go as many conferences but you know what in order to have this transformative power this transformation this life transformation is to actually allow ourselves to expose ourselves to the holy spirit to just be vulnerable and allow the spirit to reveal himself because only the revelation of the spirit can really transform us only then can he transform us we he, we can he cannot heal what we do not admit <laughs> Agree? Right? We, we, he cannot heal what we do not admit. Like, um, my brother-in-law is a physiotherapist. If I don't admit that I have a problem, yet he realizes that I have a problem, he can't touch me still. I have to admit it. <laughs> right? Right? So, like, you, you cannot. Uh, you, he, God, same way with God. God cannot heal what, you do not, what we do not admit to him. But then do we have the time to admit it to him? Do we even know what to admit to him? We need to find time, a place of solitude, so that we can. So that we allow the stillness of the Holy Spirit to permeate into our minds, our souls, our hearts, and just open us up and reveal those clothes that we need to unpack. Because only then will everything that we read, everything that we sing, everything that we hear, the truth and the revelation of the scriptures, only then can the, all that stuff have transformative power on us. Only then. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to journey together to know how we can, how you can heal our soul, to provide healing in our lives. Father, I want to just uh, take this moment of time of silence, maybe even allow the worship team to come up, to play in the background. Just take this moment to, uh, for all of us, each of us in our own space, to maybe just uh, be in the stillness and the quietness, maybe allow the words of the song to speak, so that, we, that your spirit can reveal whatever is inside our hearts that you want us to be aware of. And then allow us to pray to you and have conversation with you too so that we can have at least the first step of freedom.